funny. <laughs> <laughs> Well, some I'm Nellie Regis Savetta, co-chair of our LBT, LBTGQ Plus Rainbow Ministry here at the church. And about two years ago, I received a lovely email from my friend Rosaria, who's right here. It was one of Father Mark David Janice's small reflections. Rosaria kept sending them, and every one hit my core and my heart. I thought I'd love to have this priest come here to speak to us. And tonight, my wish is realized, and I'm very happy for that. And thanks to Rosario. Father Mark David hails from Rochester, New York. He graduated from St. John Fisher College, received his master's from Catholic University, and a PhD from the University of Connecticut. He entered the Paulist community in 1975 and was ordained on May 19, 1979. He has had a private psychology practice and has taught at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, the Ohio State University College of Medicine, as well as Indiana and Purdue University. From 23 to 2010, Father Janice served as director of the Catholic Information Center in Grand Rapids, Michigan. For two of his years there, he was also the rector of the Cathedral of St. Andrew. For the past 14 years, Father Janice has been in New York City as president and publisher of the Paulus Press. He's a prolific writer of many books, including The Heart of the Good Shepherd, and the heart of the priest, with reflections from Pope Francis. Crossing the threshold of mercy, your one wild and precious life, and his latest mercy, not sacrifice. Father is also a gifted speaker and an advocate for the LGBTQ community. I met him this afternoon, and in the short space of time we were together, I realize there's a lot more than what I found online. <laughs> so tonight, I'm not only pleased but honored to introduce to you Father Mark David Janis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. St. Cecilia's is famous. You guys are famous in the very best of, very best of ways. And so when I received an invitation to come, I thought, do I have to take a trail out? But it was, for St. Cecilia's, it worth every, 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 every moment. So I'm very happy to be with you. So again, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled to, to be invited here. Um, the name of, of, uh, of the talk tonight is, uh, Every Life is a Gospel, Finding Your Voice in a Synodal Church. And I have my own shtick here. But, but what I'd like to do, actually, before any talk that I give, is to, uh, is to ask the uh, congregation, what, is, what would you like to hear so that you don't go home thinking, this 
was a waste of a perfectly good hour. And I should have stayed home and, and uh, had my favorite beverage and, and uh, watched college basketball or whatever it is you watch. So just take a moment, think about that, because I, I, and just let me know what, what, what intrigues you. And I have plenty of room to, uh, to maneuver with, with a topic that's um, so broad. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm interested, I've always been interested, but I'm interested when you say it again, in the interlock, the intercept, and the overlap of Christian religion and psychology. Okay. And, and how they benefit one another and how they do not benefit one another. Great question. Yes. Oh, right. For those folks at home, the question is: How do um, how does how does uh, Christianity, Christian religion, and psychology overlap? How do they benefit each other, and how do they not benefit each other? Is that fair? Okay. Other things. Yes, ma'am. But then you got Mark, who's talking about, you know, if your hand causes you to uh, sin, cut it off. You know, there's these harshnesses of Jesus, and how do you bring that part of Jesus' message about God with the merciful, all-loving, ever-kind, you know, there, there seems to be a dichotomy in there. And if we want to have mercy, not sacrifice, how do we also have this Kind of vicious, you know, like demanding God. Okay. Sure. So the question is, as I understand it, please correct me, is how do we reconcile um, Jesus' rhetoric when he speaks about mercy and forgiveness, but he also speaks somewhat about, about judgment, and he can be quite severe at times. So how do we how do we reconcile that question of mercy and that question of judgment. Is that fair? Just at the Pharisees, because he definitely comes down on the Pharisees. Right. Do we have any Pharisees here? <laughs> Good, yes. Right. Sure. Sure. Right. Yes, sir. Maybe we will be here till 9 o'clock. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. How, the question is, how do I define salvation? Yes. So, um, I, I used your book last year, and I'm going to be reading it again this year. And I appreciate the contemporariness of it and you addressing some of the horrible problems we have. Yeah, you're kind, yeah. So the question, again, if I can paraphrase, and again, correct me, is how do we take sort of individual spiritual life, spiritual growth, and how do we apply that 
on a broad basis to living in a very difficult uh, world, very difficult world in so many ways, politically, economically, toxic polarization, all of that. So how does, you know, how do we, you know, what is, what's the point, you know, in some ways? Is that fair to say? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. So the, qu the question, the thought is um, to reflect a little bit about how do we, uh, you're looking at the, it was the reading from the Old Testament about, uh, uh, you know, about the, the, the famous leper who had, who uh, the prophet uh, Elijah said, just go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And he said, what, I came all this way? And this is what you want me to do. And our sometimes association with God, with the spectacular, and the you know miraculous must be spectacular. How do we uh, appreciate the miraculous that takes place? Uh, that's not so spectacular, but occurs on a daily basis. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, what attracted me to your uh, your lecture was the notion of synod synodality, and I'm not so certain. So I'd like to get your feel for what that looks like because it doesn't seem to be happening, at least from where I sit. Right. So the question is about synodality. And uh, is anybody besides Pope Francis riding that train? <laughs> and, and, if, and if we were riding the train, what would it look like? Is that fair? Exactly. Okay. Oh, oh no, I'll, I'm, I like to, I'm going to stand for this first part and then I'll, I'll sit down when I need to. Thank you. You're very kind. So how to find a balance between um, one's personal spirituality and, and kind of the thirst that we all have uh, and the need to be, uh, to be nurtured and, you know, and the demands really of social justice, the demands of, of needs that are greater than our own and, and is, is, is taking care of me very selfish or is, should I be doing more of this and, and that will take care of itself or should I do this? And then that will take care of itself. Where's the, where's the medium? Is there a medium? Is there supposed to be one? Uh, or, and if there isn't, well, how do I do this? Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. That is in the Old Testament. Right, but the right. Well, that's that's there's a there's a presage of that in in uh, the Old Testament in the Pentateuch uh, with Elijah and with the healing of the leper. This is a different leper and a different Jesus. 
you know, who, who, uh, who does it differently. So there is a, a, a in, the, in the book that I, uh, one of the books that I wrote, the, I use a lot of Old Testament stories and Old Testament imagery because we're not very familiar with that. And, you know, New Testament, blah, 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 everybody's nice. And Old Testament, I had a professor of, uh, of scripture, Father Raymond Brown, who said, you know, everybody loves preaching about the Gospel of John, love, 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 love. And he said, and the New Testament has a lot of that, to be fair, because it was written really within a, um, a 40 to 50 year period between the time of the resurrection of Jesus, kind of an upper, and the expectation that, you know, he's going to come again a week from Thursday. So the, the uh, mood is always rather upbeat. But he said, if you really want to know uh, the depths of the human condition, go to the 1500 years of the Old Testament, because that's where there's a lot of suffering. And that's where people are being people. And, and there's a lot of, uh, that reads quite differently. And sometimes uh, not so nice for us, but, but that's, that's where that is. Yes, sir. Well, it's the scripture that Jesus read. The only scripture Jesus knew were the Hebrew scriptures. And, and they illuminate his life. And I think there's a, always a tendency uh, in both the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian New Testament to take something out of context. And once we do that, we're doomed. Because it's... it's uh, then we're projecting, we're not taking something from the scripture, we're interjecting our own self into it. And when we think about the Hebrew scriptures, that's 47 books, you know, written over a 1500 year period. That's a lot, that's a lot, you know? And even the uh, Christian scriptures are 27 books written somewhere over a 40 year period. And that's a lot, so not every, not every context is the same. Yes, sir. About what? What, what, whatever you had to oh, sure, I will do that. Sure I am going to do that. Right. Okay. So the question really is, um, uh, when I'm done doing whatever it is that I'm doing, to, to be able to talk about the question of the Synod and in particular to focus on LGBTQ issues and the polarization that appears to be happening in the church in this country and universally around that issue. Is that a fair summary? Okay. All right. Well, maybe 9.30 will be done. Okay, those of you who are at home, I, you know, just uh, send out for pizza. Right, if you really wanna be good. Okay. 
I'm going to begin with something that is paradigmatic for me in the spiritual life. God does not have a plan for your life. Your life is not a scavenger hunt to figure out what God wants. There's a story, actually, the, the famous monk, Thomas Merton, I stole it from him, so I've got a, during Lent, it's bad to steal from a monk, but he tells the story uh, that uh, you die. You die, I die, go to heaven, and in the anteroom of heaven is Michael the archangel, and Michael the archangel, you don't even get to St. Peter's Gate yet, you just get Michael's sort of the clearing house, and you go in and you get into his office, and Michael, sitting in his office, puts, you know, sits down on his desk, reaches back, and gets, gets a, a manila folder that has God's plan for Mark David's life. And then you happen to be holding what actually happened in your life. And so uh, the archangel opens up yours, and he opens up what God's plan was, and he reads here, and he reads there, and... I'm standing there, and the archangel's going, hmm, oh, look at that, oh, yeah. takes out a red pencil and circles this and crosses this out. Red, red pencils are never good news, you know, and then, and then afterwards, you know, he, he stops, and he, he takes a big sigh, angelic sigh, and he says, you know, God had a really wonderful life laid out for you and you started to screw it up when you were nine <laughs> and it's gotten worse ever since and uh, he stands up and puts a wing around my shoulders and says better luck next time kid and escorts me out the door you know we have that there's a sense and, and it is part of Christian preaching. God has a plan for your life. As if, as if uh, you know, God has this thing and he's keeping it secret. You know, that is not true. That is just not true. Having said that, having said that, God does have something about your life. God does have a plan for your life, which is to love you. That's God's plan, is to love you. And to hope that you will live a life of faith, hope, and love. And how you do that, you know, once, once you have an evolutionary God, you know, and in evolution things change, right? And they, and we, and they change, we're not always in charge of the change. You know, we're, we're not in charge of the next frost coming or we're not in charge of things that go on or things that people do or um, sometimes it feels like we're not even in charge of what we do. And, and something happens and, and, and what I originally thought was going on is not going on. And, and uh, how, so what does that mean? Why, why don't we do that? What I originally thought love was is not what love is. What I originally thought faith is, is not what faith is. I give it up, uh, maybe five, six, seven times, who knows. The, the, once you have an evolutionary God, God is prepared to accompany each one of us on a journey where we begin to choose the path that we take. Now, some of that is predetermined, you know, half of that, there's genetic you know, uh, uh, predispositions that account for about 50% of our personality. And as I said, you know, environment accounts for God knows how much. But in between there, we have this Catholic thing called free will. And, 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 and God is doing God's best to encourage us to use that free will uh, to love, to be loved, to live a life of hope, to live a life of faith. And God's willing to make it up with us as we go along. Because I don't know about you, but I have not always gotten it right from the beginning, from the onset. I have, um, uh, 
this is a small thing. I'm not going to get awfully personal here because um, even though John could give me, Father John could give me confession, but absolution. But, but uh, you know, it, it's, I have never been assigned any place I ever wanted to go. <laughs> not once. Not once. And yet every place has had something wonderful and magnificent to happen within it. And I've been doing this 42, 43 years. You know what? And you would think once I would get my way. Once. No. You know, and it's, it, things happen. Things go on. I live in a community of priests, you know, and I may have this wonderful idea, but they have a lot of other ideas. So, and, and in the course of our life, things happen, and my initial plan doesn't work out, you know, in a, in a more intimate way, not so clerical. You know, I've, I've never seen any couple ever walk down the aisle getting married, thinking, well, all right, we'll do this for a couple of years, and then we'll get divorced and break our hearts and we'll move on. You know, no. Everybody who walks down the aisle is busy thinking, this is it. And yet we know 40, 50% of the time, that's not, that doesn't end up being it. Okay, so what do you do then? Well, then you got to start again. You know, your life has to start again. And you have to do, you have to, you know, faith, hope, and love has to be refashioned. You have to reform it. You have to reform it. There is a place where at the beginning, just at the beginning, where we love that Old Testament uh, imagery in Jeremiah of God as the potter and we are the clay. And I love that imagery because that means, you know, God's fingerprints are all over us. But at a certain time, we become the potter of our own clay. We're the one who decides, is this going to be with what's left? Uh, you know, with what life has given me. You know, a vase or a cup or a spittoon, what am I going to do with it, you know? So we're the ones who have to do that. And, and that's not an accident. That's by design. That's by design. Because you are not, any of us, uh, um, you know, a, a, a random combination of chromosomes. We are on purpose. We are on God's purpose. And God's purpose, as revealed to us by Jesus, is to live faith, hope, and love. We are all, we all write a little gospel. Our lives each write a little gospel of God's love. And that gospel, some are longer, some are shorter, some are in this language and some are in the other. Some address this issue and some address that issue. But we each have something to say. The Holy Spirit that brings us into life and keeps us alive is within us and is part of that evolutionary force helping us to adapt to the world that goes around us. You know, C.S. Lewis said, I have never met a mere mortal. I have only met spiritual beings struggling to find their way to God. You are, are, are not a body that has a soul. You are a soul that has a body. Now, I wouldn't be quite so dichotomous as C.S. Lewis, but you get the point. But you get the point. And, and part of our responsibility, and we'll get to this in... Um, as so we get to synodality and why synodality is and what it means, is that we are each charged with that. We are each charged with this, with this mission. We are all born with the desire, you know, to love and to be loved. As a, you know, child psychologist and working in child psychiatry, you know, kids are born and they want to make contact. Contact. You know, children see uh, when they're born, not very much. It's like me, worse than me taking my glasses off. And, and what they can see is about at 18 inches. And they see light-dark contrast. 
That's what they can see best at the beginning. Everything else is a Jackson Pollock painting. Okay, everything else is a Jackson Pollock painting. Well, what is the distance? What is 18? The biggest light dark contrast on, in the human person is the eye. And 18 inches is the distance between a mother's eye and the nursing child. We are born, we are hardwired for contact, to make contact. So we're born to love and to be loved. And, and the child, even though the child doesn't see very well, the child is, is riveted. That's what it, and it begins to know things from that. We begin to know who we are from how we are touched, from how we are held, from, from, from that first contact. That's one of the, it's a psychological principle that's part of the creative principle of life. And that doesn't stop. I mean, it, you know, I got my glasses on, I can see a lot more. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot more than a Jackson Pollock painting out there. Uh, uh, everyone is really rather different and unique. But, um, and I've become rather different and unique over the course of my time, surprising myself. But, but that's, but those things, are the same. God's language is the language of love. The human language is the language of love. It is not as e an easy language to learn. It's an easy language to desire. It's a want that doesn't go away, but it is not an easy language to learn as we grow older and as we become more complex. Okay? What else do I want to say here at this point? So the issue in many ways has to be how do we find what is our part of the gospel? What is our part of God's good news? And that's whether you're born Christian or whether you are a Buddhist or whether you're a Muslim or whether you are nothing. Everyone has some of that image and likeness of God within us that, that is searching. As Augustine said, my, my, my heart is searching for you, O oh God, and I cannot rest until I rest in thee. We are all looking for that, and we all have something to say about that. We all have a contribution to make. We are part of God's ongoing creation. Can I say that again? We are part of God's ongoing creative process. We make the mistake of thinking, well, creation happened, whether you know, you're a literal seven-dayer or whether you're a big boomer, you know, however it is that you understand creation happens. Creation is not stopped. Creation is ongoing. The Dutch bishops say it so beautifully. Said, you know, uh, God is not like a, a carpenter who builds this chair and then is done with the chair and then just goes away to build another chair in another room someplace. If God were not holding this chair together, it would cease to exist. And so, not that we're chairs, but, but, but the part of what God does is to, is to, well, in the theological language, to, commun to give, communicate God's self, to spirit. Part of God is in all of us. Yearning to get the whole boat and of, of love. And, and part of our mission, how, whatever religious belief or lack of it we have, is to contribute to that ongoing creative process of God without which there would be nothing here. There would be nothing here. We would not be here. The universe would not be here. Okay? Can I stop with that? Is that, and we have questions, is that clear? Now, I have to warn you right away. I, I have uh, been preaching for 42, three years, and uh, taught in medical school for over 20. And I have, I have devised 
um, a mechanism in myself that says, if I say something and everybody is being quiet, my assumption is you are sitting there saying, damn, he is good. <laughs> and that couldn't possibly be any clearer. You know, and hooray. Now, if that, now, that may be delusional, I'm, I, you know, it might be, but, but it's how I get along in life, you know? When you talk for a living, you got to do that, okay? So if something is not or doesn't fit right to you or doesn't seem quite right, I, you know, you have to, like, speak up or, uh, or forever hold your, and I, just let me delude myself along as the night goes on. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The question is, why bother? Why did God bother to make us anyway? Is this a matter of God's creative, just just amusement? I've got nothing else to do. How about creation? You know, uh, and that's a good question. And it has to do with the very nature of God. God is love. Love is a verb. It's not a noun. It's not a, a thing. Okay, it's, it's a verb. It moves, it lives, it breathes, it moves on. God is always moving, breathing. I don't know if God breathes, but, but you know, God... God is, God is always in action, and love is always loving. And as Thomas Aquinas would say, Father Ganey knew Thomas Aquinas, as, as Thomas Aquinas say, love desires a lover. Love desires an object to love. That's who God is. And so we are, are the object of God's love. Creation is the object of God's love. And that's, that's God's intent. That's what God does all day. That's what God, whatever days are for God, but God, that's what God does all day, is to love. And why does anything exist? It's so God can love that. Is that... Right. Right. The question is, could God do this more efficiently? And um, you can take that up with the deity, you know, when we get there. And I, I think that's, uh, but part of the answer that I want to, to give you, because I think it's so important, is that um, God doesn't make anyone love God. God doesn't make anyone love him or her. God can't make, God doesn't do that. God allows free will to occur. Otherwise, it wouldn't be love, would it? I'd be doing what I was pre-programmed to do. Okay? And so, but once God allows that, once that sneaky free will thing comes in and I can choose and not to choose, it is a mess. You know, it is, which is where mercy comes into play. Because, uh, as I said, love is a difficult thing to do. It's a hard language to learn. It's a hard life to live. Everybody here has lots of experience trying to do it and being successful and unsuccessful and getting better and sometimes worse and then sometimes having a huge surprise. You know? So it's, it's, that's the price that God pays for wanting to be loved back. Is, 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 you know, God makes something that's not God, and so that's us, here we go, not God. Well, it depends what day you get me on, how closely I believe that. And, and then my job is to, how do I love? How do I love? And since I'm not just sitting in my chair oozing love to God, I love you, God, I love you, God, I love you, God. Since I have to love God in creation, 
the creation where I am put. And that creation includes you. And, uh, you know, some of you are very annoying. And that makes it more difficult. Some of you have bought my book four times. Much easier to love you. And, uh, you know, it's, it, people are different. You know, and loving in difficult circumstances is, gets to the question of mercy and sacrifice and the rest of that. And, and it, is, it is one of the conundrums of God uh, in that way. But it is, it is God's desire. It's love's desire to be loved. It's love's desire to be loved. There is that great uh, phrase of Jesus on the cross, I thirst which doesn't mean, you know, just that he's thirsty, although he probably was. He thirsts for us. The theological reason for writing that is I thirst. Time for a small commercial. There's a great book here called Thirst, Our Desire for God, God's Desire for Us, not written by me, but published by Paulus Press. It's written by Jose Tolentino Mendoza. Uh, who was the uh, vice rector of a seminary in uh, Portugal when he preached this. These are the talks he gave to a Lenten retreat to the Pope and the Curia. And next September, he was a cardinal. So it's really a good retreat, huh? <laughs> so, but, but the point is... Uh, pardon? On how to become a cardinal. Well, no, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it, I, I've been trying this, but it hasn't worked yet. <laughs> But it worked for him. Tolentino's a lovely man. And one of the things, if you want other reading besides me, I'll, you know, even I get bored with my words, he's really quite good. Okay, but God thirsts for us, which is a concept that it's almost impossible to wrap our head around. But it's true. That's, that's what the whole crucifix is about. It's an expression of God's thirst for us. There's nothing I will not do for you, to get you, to love you. Even when you are at your worst, okay? All right. Well, there is this little thing called sin. Right, right, right. Well, you know, uh, things were pretty good in the Garden of Eden. And then, you know, Cain killed Abel, and we haven't stopped. You know, since that time, you know, it's Eve, Eve goes and, and is tempted by the snake, and, uh, and then goes and tempts Adam, and then Adam blames her for it. You know? And it's, so, um, love is hard to do. Okay, which is why, which brings me to part two of my talk, which is conveniently dealing with how do we, uh, how do we do this? If it, this all sounds so cool, but how do we do this? And, and the problem is there's a lot of mistakes in doing this, okay? Where it, it's very hard, it's very awkward to do this. And this is why, this is about Lent. I'm gonna get a little plug to Lent. I know you're halfway through it but you still have a few weeks to go, you can grab a hold of it. And, and uh, uh, Lent is, is not a self-improvement program, okay? Lent is, is, as I write in my book, it's actually probably the best two lines in the book. Lent is love growing in two directions, reaching out and digging deep. A plant needs roots to be able to, to, to find sustenance. And the sustenance goes up and helps the leaves go up. Because if the leaves don't find sun, then you just have a lot of dead roots. So in Lent, what we do is we look at ourselves as lovers. We look at ourselves as purveyors of our own gospel, the gospel that we are writing. And, and we have to uh, dig deeper in some ways, and we have to also reach out. It's not just a matter of, of sitting in my room and contemplating me. It's, it's, it's a matter of reaching out. 
to those other people God made. Uh, made for me to help, yes. But also, uh, there's a lot for me to learn from you. Now remember that when we get to synodality, because that's the core piece of synodality and Francis's understanding of church. And so what we have to do is we have to, in this period of time, we, we, have, to, we have to dig deep, deeper into the scriptures, deeper into our own experience of life, uh, which is what happens with psychologists and spiritual directors and all of that, and we have to reach up and out. Because a great deal of what Jesus had to say, what he learned in the Hebrew scriptures, is we have to reach up and out beyond ourselves. We are not, we are not bull moose, you know? We, we are made in communion and for communion. And that's the only way that we live. You know, we, we differ from, uh, sometimes there's some uh, branches of evangelical Christianity that annoy me and they say, well, it's just Jesus and me. No, where does that come from? That's not the story at all. Where, does, where is that written? You know, it's about, the, the, the most annoying thing about Jesus is that it, here comes everybody. Here comes everybody. And that's what got him killed, by the way. But that's, that's the, um, because we don't want everybody. Let me tell you a story. It's in the, I think it's in the Lent book. But I, when I was in, uh, I forget where I was, but I was invited to a, a Methodist men's prayer breakfast and a Friday prayer breakfast, you know, and, and I tell you what, I know you've got a great choir here, you've got a good music program, but Catholics can't hold a candle to Methodist men singing hymns. They sing hymns, so God has to stop whatever God is doing and take notice, okay? So they're up there and they're singing hymns, this is like at seven o'clock in the morning. This is, you know, geez, uh, you know, I'm a Catholic. I don't, we don't, you know, seven o'clock in the morning at the cathedral, I, quiet mass is good. But singing 15 hymns, every freaking verse. <laughs> I mean, this is like, uh, this is all Lent in one morning. Not done. And then we go for the breakfast part, and I'm going to talk at the breakfast part about whatever I'm going to talk about. And, uh, and the Methodist men can not only sing, they can eat. And I go downstairs for the prayer breakfast, and there's, there's eggs benedict, and there are scrambled eggs, and there are fried eggs, and there's bacon, and there are pork chops, who I never had for breakfast, but they're relatives to bacon. And they had sausage gravy, you know, and, and, and all of that stuff is going on. And in honor of their uh, a Catholic visitor, they made me a little kale omelet. <laughs> you know, there it was. So there's all this going on. And I'm eating this little kale omelet, you know, and thinking, <laughs> I have better things to do with my time. But anyway, I give a talk. And at part of the talk, it's one of the men, you know, it's just everyone's in a good mood, so it's sort of a teasing question and says, why do Catholics give things up for Lent? This year, I'm giving up kale for Lent. And I thought, well, I, in one of my more inspired moments, good for you, because that means when you go to heaven, you will have endless, endless acres of kale. God will make it up for you, okay? Lent is not about what we exclude. It's about who we include. Lent is not about what we exclude. It's about who we include. And, and in the course of our world, in the course of life, Things get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, 
And that's, uh, and when things get that small, the Holy Spirit doesn't have much of a chance to huff and puff and fan our soul into flame. Because this is, we are not self-igniting, you know, starters. We need, we need the, 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 the fire that comes from people who you would never expect can give it to you. Okay? So Lent is about who we include. And, it's, and we all have this, this tendency to, to, uh, to exclude, you know. And, and this is why polarization occurs. Because we are, are, you know, we begin to talk just to one another, and and sometimes and sometimes I can't even talk to you, so I just talk to me. On the, I get on the computer and I write all these great things for me, and and, and so our, our we we get we get tiny, we get tiny, you know. I had a great um, professor of theology, Father Charles Curran who looked at all of us first-year theologians who, of course, after one course of moral theologian, of theology, knew everything. And he said, you know, gentlemen, your problem is your God is too small. And he was right. Not that we knew it then, and not that we were eager to include too much more. But that was... That was, that's the deal. So we have to begin on the thrust, really, of, of, of the Hebrew scriptures and the, uh, and the Christian New Testament is bigger, 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 bigger. How do we include? And it doesn't, you know, you don't have to, I, I live in New York City, you don't have to go down to the United Nations and sit there and hug everybody that's there. You know, there's one devastating line in the Old Testament and that says, like, do not neglect your kin. You know, uh, I, you know um, I am a specialist in neglecting kin that I don't want to talk to, <laughs> you know? And don't neglect your kin, you know? I mean, it's, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. Sometimes the people that we neglect are the people who we share the same pillow with. You know, so it's a question of opening, 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 opening. And that's the purpose of Lent is to, is, is, and I'm going to talk about prayer in just a moment, but, but a big part of that is to open up. We fast so that there's more to give. Not so that, you know, I have a bigger savings account. You know, or I give my little rice bowl to the Catholic Relief Services, though I'm a big believer in the rice bowl. Everyone should get 10 of them to fill out. But it's like it's, the purpose of fasting is, is to scrape away some of the barnacles on my ship. And, and so I have more room to give. So I have more room to give. You know, almsgiving, almsgiving does more for me than for, than for someone else you know, than the person I give to. You know, there's, there's something about that. I reach out, I reach out. Sometimes the, uh, the biggest alms in these days is time. Time. Everybody has poverty of time. You know, there are friends we haven't spoken to and God knows when. Or, or couples haven't got out on a date or you know, done anything with each other, and so because why? They're busy, and it's a busy world. And so we have no time. So poverty of time is enormously important. So what is that, what is almsgiving? What does it mean, not just giving money, it's like giving, what is, what's more valuable to me than anything else? My time, I am a time pig, you know? This is my time. Well, it's not, it's God's time. It's God's time. And it's my job to fill that time with the gospel, that little itty bitty gospel, no matter how insignificant I think it is, to somebody else. That's, that's what I do. That's what I do. And to touch a little bit about prayer, you know, it's uh, uh, even, uh, um, 
the longer I, there's so many ways of praying. Father, uh, another Paul's father that, that Father John and I know, Father Jack Kenny, who taught, brought hundreds of, really of people into the church said, you know, one of the great things about Catholicism, it's like your aunt's attic. And, and if you've got something and it doesn't work anymore, let it go and go find something else in the attic. If, you know, the rosary doesn't work for you, don't say, oh, I can't pray. Go find something else. There's something else there. There's all kinds of different things. You don't have to do it this way or that way or the other way. But prayer is essentially, I think at this point, what I'm going to suggest to you is time to let God love you. Okay? When I pray to God, I am not telling God anything God doesn't know. This is not like my little Twitter feed to, to God. You may not know what's going on down here. I don't want to fill you in. God knows. You know, you may know what's happening in my soul. No one knows the burdens I carry. Well, God knows. That's, that's, uh, it's not like I'm filling God in on news. You know, it, it's like it's time to let God love you which is harder than it sounds, which is harder than it sounds. Why? And this is psychology with this. When, when I am busy loving, doing the loving, I am in control. I am picking who I am going to love and how I'm going to love you. I look at my, my, my things and I say, oh, well, here, you need this. I'm going to give you this because you do need it. And, and maybe that's true. Uh, but love always has a certain element of my choice. To be loved, I'm not in charge of that. To be loved is to be open, to be defenseless. To be loved for nothing. We all want to be loved for something. I want you to love me because I do this, or because I look like that, or because I'm better than this, or because these other people are nowhere near as good as. I want you to love me for something. I want to earn it. But God just loves you for you, whatever you, whatever you are. And that's very hard to accept that love. Relationships and couples, that is so hard to accept. To be loved for nothing. I didn't invent this, by the way. Teresa of Avila did. Again, during Lent, it's bad to misquote saints and monks. You gotta, I'm, a, I'm a publisher. You've got to give you know, <laughs> footnotes. But she said, you've got to love God for nothing. But you've got to let God love you for nothing. And that's a much harder thing to do. Pope Francis talks about this a lot. And you don't have to say anything, you don't have to do anything, but just let that happen. You know, I, uh, um, if you can't think of anything else to do in the morning, in the shower, sit, stand there for two minutes under the hot water and, and with some sort of thanksgiving and gratitude and appreciate you, that God is appreciating loving you. That's so important. That's so very, very, very important. Those are roots that go down. You have to let God water your roots. You have to let God water your roots. And sometimes God, a lot of times, God waters your roots with the community that you're around, that you serve, who takes care of you. And sometimes you have to let God water your roots uh, through, um, you know, just, just letting God do it by God's self. That's what prayer is about. That's why, that's why personal prayer is so important. Because I'll tell you what, after 40 years of practice in psychology, never, 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 ever has somebody walked into my office and sat down and said, oh, doctor, I, I can't, you know, if, if one more person comes and tells me they love me, I, I guess can't take it. <laughs> no one is loved enough. Okay, no one's overloved. Okay, 
and to appreciate God's love. We're not going to do that completely, by the way, on this side of heaven. But we ought to make a start. huh? Can we make a start doing it that way? Where are we now? <gasps> okay, well... One more thing about prayer, and then we're going to move on a little bit here because it's, we're, we're dragging on time here. Um, it takes a lot of courage to be you. It takes a lot of courage to be you. It takes a lot of courage to live your faith, hope, and love. Whatever it looks like, whatever it is, I don't need to know what it is. Doesn't have to be the Nicene Creed. I don't care. Okay? But it takes courage to be you. And prayer is where you get the courage to be you. Because without that, then I start not being me. I start, I start, um, I lose the, the confidence and the courage to be the person God made. And that God has made along with me. And I start being who you want me to be because I know that I'm going to get an applause here. And if I can't get love, applause is pretty good. Applause is pretty good. And so prayer is important because it has to give us the courage to be ourselves. I'm now going to shift off a little bit into the synod and the fundamental idea of the synod. The, the synod is uh, a word. Uh, it comes from, it is the next phase of what we would in theology call the reception of the Vatican Council, understanding what's in the Vatican Council. And, and part of what's in, written there that nobody pays much attention to is this. The prime sacrament is baptism. And everyone here who's baptized is baptized priest, prophet, and king. Every single person which means that everybody here has, has, has a message, has a responsibility about prayer, has a responsibility about searching out what is the will of the Holy Spirit, who is pretty elusive sometimes, and King, how do we actually do this in the real world, in the governing world? Everyone is baptized priest, prophet, and king. Everyone, which means everyone is responsible for the mission of the church. As Pope Francis says, we invert the pyramid. And, and what, what happens with, when you've got a large group of people who are all baptized, filled with, not only made in the image and likeness of God, but also baptized with the Holy Spirit. What happens with that? You have something to say. You have something to say, which means we have to listen. We don't always have to agree, but you have something to contribute. And the essence of a synodal church is a church that listens. We have to listen to one another. Rather than you listening to whoever else is, is on the... And, and that means the people who are in orders, our job is to be the servant of the servants of God. Which means our major job is to listen to you. I just preach at you, tell you, but to listen at the last synod, which is why people don't like it. Okay? Why don't people like it? Because you're going to tell me things 
that I don't want to know. You're going to share experiences that are difficult for me. And I have to, I have to take that seriously. Listening is tough work. I taught medical school. You know how long it is? The average length of time between the time when your physician asks you a question and he or she interrupts? <laughs> Seven seconds. If you have someone who waited 10 seconds, double their fee. <laughs> and that's, that's the time. And what happens if you're always being interrupted? The patient stops talking. And if the patient stops talking, the doctor stops learning. And when I stop learning about you, then what do I do? Then I commit malpractice. I, what I think is going on with you, not what really is going on with you. Huh? So the, the, the idea, and Francis doesn't even know how all this is going to work himself. But, but, but the point is to gather people together and to, and to listen. That was what the last synod was. And the preparation was to gather people to listen. Now, what is the problem with this organization, with this thing? It's because um, it's not power-based. It's listening-based, you know? And... Um, uh, men, we have a Y chromosome. We like to do things. We, we don't like asking for directions. We, we don't like, you know, you say four words, I can finish your sentence for you because I know, I have experience. And, and we like to do stuff, you know, it's stupid stuff, but we like to do stuff. Doing is, it, this is what happens with that broken Y chromosome. We, we don't like listening. And are not as adept at understanding the grace, the power of the Holy Spirit that comes from listening to other people. And, 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 and that's why and it's, that's why whatever country you go to, there's, there's uh, some questions about, well, what does this mean? What are we going to do? How is anything going to get done? Who's going to decide? How is this going to happen? Well, I don't know. And, and quite frankly, Francis doesn't quite know either. Um, and he has his own blind spots in listening. You know, there are things he's not as good at listening to. As, as he might be, as we wish he would be. On the other hand, there's a lot of things that we don't listen to that just, you know, tick him off royal, you know? So it's gonna take time for this listening process to go on. And it's going to take the courage of people to speak up and to share what uh, people's experience is. And to share it with people who are not exactly excited about listening to it. Okay? I loved, you know, if you're a warm, receptive audience, that's really good. You know, the hardest group to preach to are priests. You know, when I do priest retreat, man, there's not enough money to pay me to do a priest retreat. Because we just sit there and we say, I dare you to impress me. How dare you think you can tell me something new? You know, that's a tough audience, you know? And we can be a tough audience, huh? So how to have that courage to share that part of the Holy Spirit that's within you, that little gospel that's been given to you? How can we do that? How does that happen? And that's, that's the key part. And, and, and you're not always going to have receptive listeners with all of that. You know, it's, it's um, yeah, I was with, I have to leave the person un, unnamed, but, it, you know, was a was, um, prominent woman theologian. And he was sitting in a conference room with, was there with Francis, and he was saying, 
you have to stop saying that, um, you know, there's a feminine model of homekeeping and there's a masculine model of protecting. He said, that's, you just stop, stop. I know that what it may have been like in your house as you were growing up, but stop, because that's not it. Just stop. And he has stopped that, but he doesn't know what to put in its place. <laughs> you know, he just doesn't have it yet. He just doesn't have it yet. But he knows that's, that's a thing that's there. He doesn't, um, he doesn't understand, uh, he calls it gender ideology, because um, I think people have fed that to him. Well, you know, I, uh, you know I, I, I'm a biologically oriented psychologist, psychiatrist, and whatever else transgender is, this is something that's in, that, that is very complex. Um, uh, in firing in the DNA, um, in the womb, and the formation of the brain. And, uh, and none of us really know, except we know that it's real. Okay. I remember uh, I, was, I, I was the, like the, the child adolescent assessment guru at Ohio State, and, and came this little nine-year-old boy. Uh, from farming country, you know, uh, Centerville, Ohio, which is, which is, it, you, it's not nowhere, but you can see nowhere. Okay, and, and, and in, in a pair of grandparents who look like American Gothic, you know, in jeans and, and, and coveralls, and I, I suspect that it was in a pitchfork, but I, I will bet dollars to donuts there was a gun in the car. And they brought the kid in, and my, my colleague said, okay, you assess this kid. You know, he was, they went to see that, but they said, oh, no, you're the one who can do it. So I did it, and I, I did all my little voodoo and tea leaves and all of this for a couple of weeks. And then I brought it to, to others. Uh, and I said, okay, here are some testing results. You tell me, is this a boy or a girl? And these were some very prominent people in the country. And they said, well, that's obviously a girl. It's obviously a girl. And I'm thinking, OK, that's how I read it. But that's, you know, and I, uh, none of us actually know how that's true, but we kind of got that. And the little boy came in dressed like a little boy and blah, blah, blah. But he was a girl and in his brain. and. Uh, so they said, well, you did the testing. You explain it to the parents, to the grandparents. I said, oh, thanks. You know, no, it's your patient. You do it. And I'm sitting there, and I try to boil this down as succinctly as I can. Nine-year-old little boy. Oh, I wish I could remember his name. I can't. Nine-year-old boy. And I explain it, and uh, it's met with deafening silence. And I'm, you know, good psychologist that I am. I'm just sitting and letting the silence play itself out. And I'm thinking, he is going to kill me. <laughs> he is going to kill me. He is going to kill me. Uh, that day, I took pains to wear a bow tie. So because a long tie, he could just strangle me with it, you know. <laughs> it's harder to do with a bow tie. And, and they sat uh, for five, it was at least five minutes. And then, and then Grandpa says to Grandma, or, uh, you know, Grandpa says to me, well, what do we call him? I, I said, pardon me? And he looks to Grandma and he says, well, what, what, what do we call him? You know, is it, is it, you know, what name do we use? <laughs> and and I was, and it was my turn to be silent because I, I was just listening to American Gothic, you know, just, just there. And, and uh, the grandmother then knew that I was just a poor, stupid psychologist and said, you know, doctor, we love this kid when we walked in. And we're going to love him, her, when we walk out. So give us a little help here, because we're going to do it. And to this day, to this day, you know, 
it sends shivers up my spine. So I don't know, and I can't explain it, but I know that it's real. I understand uh, homosexuality. I, you know, I can, I, genetically, I think I've got a great theory about that. I've kind of got that. What I can't explain is heterosexuality, to be truthful. But I can't explain homosexuality and genetic formation, brain formation. And here is this thing. And what was the, what was the question? There was no explanation. And they said, well, we just love this kid. So who, who is he? What, is, what do we say? Wow. 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 So I've told that story to a couple of cardinals here and there. Um, on, our, on, our, on our terrazzo in Rome. And I thought, well, they're going to throw me out. But, but they, you know, they, they were dumbfounded as I was dumbfounded. I don't know how we explain that. How do we explain? And what, I don't, what they don't know how to explain is that kind of love. Okay? Right. The, the, uh, the genetic formulation and all that, I don't get it. Nobody, I know. My best friends at John Hopkins who study this stuff all the time, they don't get it. But, you know, it's going to be easier to understand it when they get it than it's going to be to understand those grandparents. Okay? Because that's just like it's hard to understand the crucifixion, like it's hard to understand the resurrection. Let me deal with the LGBT2 question for a bit. You know, um, in the church, depending on, on, culture always wins, okay? Wherever the church is, culture wins. We tend to think, oh no, we influence culture, we do blah, 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 blah. No, culture wins by and large. Okay, we can alter it, fix it a little bit, but, but it takes a long time to alter a culture. And, um, and what's happened in Western Europe and in the United States is, um, is that the culture just decided, this is crazy. Now, the gospel part, the, the Old Testament parts and the Pauline parts, that's a different talk. Nobody has time for that, energy for that. I can tell, explain to you why that doesn't say what it says, but leave that apart. But what has happened is that more people have done more listening around this issue and have met more people and know more people and are thinking, this can't be right. You know, this, this can't be right. This can't be right. I was up at our summer place at Lake George and I'm, Hitting golf balls when in the days when I could play, I love hitting golf balls, man. I was like, Shh, that was it. And um, I had an Ohio State bag because I was still teaching there. And there was another Ohio State guy who was there. And he comes over and says, "Oh, Fada, you know, oh God, okay." And he asks about the sexual abuse thing, and so okay, that gives my practice. So I say something. And then he goes away and he practices. And then he comes back and says, I got to do this. I said, you know, I don't get this. I have been a Knight of Columbus, whatever level it is, 99th level for whatever the deal is. And the bishops are having this big thing. And I, I can't give them any money because I have a grandson who's gay. I wish he wasn't gay, but he is gay. And I'm not going to give to anything that's going to hurt my grandson. And so as I went back to practice, I was thinking, lost. Because <laughs> if this guy has moved, you know, if this guy, the second pillar on the right-hand side of the Knights of Columbus, has moved, then there's nothing else holding up the building. <laughs> you know, I, I have a lot of friends who are in Europe, and... and uh, the, the day they came out, whatever it was, and they said that, you, you know, you can't, uh, we can't talk about, you can't bless. There was this terrible letter that came out from uh, the CDF. It said, well, no, we can't, 
you know, we can't bless gay couples because, uh, you know, we can't bless evil. Well, the next week, two in 2,000 parishes in Germany, parish priests just bless people. They just did it. They just did it. You know, the, the, uh, the Belgian bishops have actually written a rite, which Francis is trying not to have happen. And the German bishops have, you know, the, these German guys, are, they're not stopping for nobody. They're just doing it. You know, and at, at the same time in the church in Africa, if you think about the culture, it's, it's, they kill people for being gay. You know, uh, um, in, uh, it, it's such a misogynist culture in India that women uh, get raped in a bus and that's just the way it goes. You know, so there's, there's large cultural divisions that the gospel is not yet penetrated. Or that the Africans will say, ah, oh, here you come, colonialists, once again, coming to dump your white European talk on us. And we're not having any part of it. Well, I think, um, I think that's just the state of it right now. That's the state of it. I, don't, I, I think it's going to stay that way for a while. I think more and more and more. Um, you know, the church has got bigger problems, you know, than, than people being in love with each other. You know, I mean, this is, this is not the biggest issue we have. You know, when we have children in cages at the, at the you know, if we, if we go to, you know, in the 12th century, you needed, you needed three things to be a Catholic. You needed to know the Apostles' Creed, the short version. You needed to know the Our Father, and you needed to know the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. And if you had that down, you got it, which I think is still pretty good. You know, who needs the catechism? I mean, that's, you know, if we had that and did that, you know, we wouldn't have enough churches in the world if, if that's what we did. But I'm afraid the cultural divide uh, overwhelms sometimes the uh, the uh, the religious the religious divide, and and some and depending where the culture is or how how much time people spend listening, that's when the church begins to move. And never ever ever in the history of the of the church has anything big happened from the top down. It's always happened from the bottom up, the census fidelium up. So the synod is a mess, but listening to each other is a mess. Having the patience to listen and not to, and not to stop talking is quite difficult. But it's worth talking because you each have a gospel to give. You're baptized with that. That's the prime sacrament. The ur sacrament is baptism. And the phrase that's now being thrown around is we are co-responsible for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not my possession, it's yours. As much as mine. Think of what happens on Sunday and then we'll st I'll stop talking, speaking of stopping talking. You know, we, go, we come to Mass and we hear, people of God, we all hear the word of God. You know, Old Testament, New Testament, we sing a psalm. We, we, we hear a gospel, somebody shares their experience, hopefully about seven, eight minutes. And, and, then, and, and so we have, we have experienced a real presence of Christ, real presence of the Holy Spirit in the word of God, so we believe. And then people bring up the gifts, and then the elements, uh, again, the Holy Spirit comes, and they become, uh, uh, through God's mercy, the body and blood of Christ, and then where does the body and blood of Christ go? Into the people who are there. Okay. And so then where is, the, where is the real presence of Christ? It's in the congregation. And then we say, as we leave, go glorify God with your lives. Which was written actually by Pope Benedict XVI. He insisted that be put in. 
Because there is, that's the real presence of Christ. We are each a Corpus Christi procession. Because it, it's, it's hard for people to listen. You know, the Second Vatican Council was written by theologians who were condemned for 50 years. You know, it takes a while. It take, listening is a tough thing. It's a tough thing. But then finally listening happens. Grace happens. I believe it. I've seen it. I believe it. It's there. You know, I've seen it happen with, with, with American Gothic from Centerville, Ohio. So with that, it's a terrible death to be talked to it, Mark Twain said. And so I'm not going to talk you to death anymore. Uh, I'm going to stop and, if you, and uh, people get to stretch. And why don't we, we can call it a night for, so people don't feel guilty about leaving. And if those people, some people want to come and ask questions, I'll hang around and do that because what am I doing anyway? There you go. Okay. One other commercial from my friend uh, from Paulus Press, um, from my good friend Jose Tolentino Mendonca, Cardinal Mendonca, No Journey is Too Long, which is about friendship in the Christian life and the spirituality of friendship. Outstanding book. Worth it. Okay, thank you. You've been wonderful. God bless you all. Thank you. It was really uplifting. It gave us a lot to think about. And uh, thank you so much for making the trip. Okay, thank you. And if anybody wants to cookies or sodas, help yourself. There we go. Thinking that Paul is to have a lot of lit.